So, Roger, you've been a long-standing should talk win here, True. and yeah. uh, everybody has sort of seen you someplace on the grounds. So, how did you connect with Chautauqua? Well, that's always an interesting story. Um, it was in the late uh, 80s or early 90s. Our son, who's now 31, was three years old, and um, I was raised by an aunt and uncle, and my, unfortunately, they got divorced, but fortunately, my uncle remarried, and his second wife was a Chautauquan. And so all of a sudden, uh, we were invited to come up to Chautauqua. And it was quite an eventful first trip. We were here on the weekend that, um, July 4th weekend, when Sharp Field, the stadium, is, is that the name? The, yep. It burned down that, that night. There was a terrible fire in the middle of the night that burned down that stadium. It was hot. They lived in the Keystone, my uncle and his uh, second wife. And we were in the kitchen sleeping, my wife uh, Susie and I, and uh, on a cot. And when you rolled over, you hit the uh, oven door. <laughs> and it was hot as hell. It was one of the hottest nights ever in July. And then the fire alarms went off the whole night. So it was like, I finally said, wow, do you, do you like this place? <laughs> and, so it was, a, it was kind of a rough first experience. But we came back for more and uh, started coming, like everybody does at Chautauqua, for a week, and then two, and then three. And then we finally bought a place. Yeah. So, Roger, uh, we're going to get into your bio through the course of the interview, but uh, crisis management certainly is one of the principal jobs you had. And if you were an official at Chautauqua Institution on your first day during the Sharp Field Fire, <laughs> how would you respond? I know you have this five-point crisis communication team. How would you have reacted to that crisis at that fire on the beloved Sharp Field? Well, that's right. That does make it relevant. Um, never thought of it in those terms. Uh, I was only bothered by being uh, awake all night. But... Um, First and foremost, you know, you, you, you've got to as quick as possible, and that was pre-internet, uh, pre-digital media, pre-today when actually news and information is instantaneously out there, almost worldwide, and usually out there, like you take a company like Marriott that I worked for for 30-some years, um, Mar if something happened at a Marriott today, Marriott's not likely to be the first company to have a photo of it or to even have a comment on whatever happened because somebody with their cell phone or some other means is going to instantly move that. So it's a whole new world. But back then, there are a couple tenets that I would have uh, carried out for the sharp field <laughs> fire. And number one, you get the information out as soon as possible. I have no idea what Chautauqua did. Uh, but, and I had no idea what was, at, what was at their disposal, but the first and foremost is to get all the information that you have as soon as possible and get it out there. Reassure, tell people about it. Don't try to, if, if you don't know something, that's fine at the beginning, but share all the information as quickly as possible and then gather all data so that you can uh, inform people about what caused the fire. Um, what are we going to do uh, now that the fire occurred? What are we, you know, what's going to happen with Sharfield? Uh, to relate it to Marriott, one of the things we always try to do in terms of crisis communications, you want to get things back to normal as soon as possible. I don't know how strong the Chautauqua brand was in 1989 or 1990, whenever that fire was. But at Marriott, can you imagine if, you're, uh, if you hear about the explosion uh, of the uh, uh, somebody dead in, someone detonated a bomb at the Islamabad Pakistan Marriott killing 54 people and Marriott's a big target wherever there's a Marriott they got that big sign out there and they're an American name and there's a lot of people in hotels so how are you going to feel that night and there's a lot of people in this position about staying at your local friendly Marriott after a bomb goes off. Is, is Marriott a target? Might they target another Marriott hotel that I'm gonna be staying? So you want to bring things back to normal and reassure as soon as possible. And uh, that would have been the case with uh, the Sharp Fire. There we go. Uh, talk about uh, your background, Roger. In the beginning, obviously you were born just oh, four or 40 sure. years ago. And then kind of bring us up to how you got to Marriott. Yeah, sure. Um, 
a little bit of background. That's always interesting. And when I, I used to speak a lot at, at Marriott, and, and I would always start with a little bit of background because I figure people like to know sort of where you came from and, and that kind of thing. But I grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, um, nice capital town of the state of Pennsylvania. But beyond that, um, not an overwhelmingly great shakes place, but I never was bothered by Harrisburg. I thought it was a fine place to grow up and live. And um, my father worked on the railroad. I mean, worked on the railroad, not in management. He worked on the railroad. And my mother did not work. And um, I was the oldest of four kids. And um, I think your mother worked. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. My mother did not work outside the house. And that would be my first PR mistake of this session. <laughs> Even PR guys screw it up now and then. Anyway, um, my mother worked hard. Um, my father worked on the railroad, and uh, we were a very average, uh, you know, fair, I would say low to middle income family. And uh, for some reason, uh, in high school, I got this interest in journalism, in writing, and working on the school newspaper. And I met in, uh, in my class, well, I didn't meet, but in my class was a girl by the name of Diane Baum. And Diane's father, John Baum, who I later got to know and meet, was the publisher of the Harrisburg Patriot News, which is the newspaper in Harrisburg, owned by a relatively small paper compared to the Cleveland Plain Dealer and many others, but owned by the Newhouse Media Empire. Uh, Conde Nast and newspapers all over the country, including the Cleveland Plain Dealer and many more, and TV stations were all part of the Newhouse Media Empire. And Little did I know that the Harrisburg Patriot News was one of those. And so I started dating uh, Diane Baum. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, that helped me get a summer job uh, with, her, uh, with the Harrisburg Patriot News through her father, a summer internship. And lo and behold, when I was applying to colleges, uh, Newhouse, the Newhouse uh, wealthy family, had um, built a fabulous new communication school at Syracuse University called the Newhouse School of Communications. And it opened in 1964 with Lyndon Baines Johnson, if you can believe. They had uh, President Johnson at the opening of the Newhouse School, designed by I.M. Pei. Uh, so a lot, of, um, a lot of fanfare associated uh, that the uh, Newhouse family brought together for, for that school at Syracuse. And John Baum, uh, the publisher of a Newhouse newspaper helped me get a scholarship to Syracuse and Newhouse. And so uh, that's how it kind of all began to happen. Um, if you want me to jump to Marriott, I mean, right after college, I felt like I owed it to the Harrisburg Patriot News to come back there and be a reporter with them <laughs> after all of John Baum's help. Meanwhile, I had broken up with Diane, his daughter, long ago. <laughs> um, anyway. I came back as a reporter uh, with the Harrisburg Patriot News right after I graduated. They put me in the Hershey Bureau. I don't know if you know Harrisburg, but very close to Harrisburg is Hershey, the home of Hershey Chocolate, about 20 minutes away. And they had opened up a bureau office, and I was the reporter in Hershey. And Hershey, um, uh, it was the patriarch, the matriarch, the, the total all-being of the town of Hershey, the chocolate company. Uh, Herco, which runs Hershey Park and the hotels and everything else. And they didn't like some of the stories I was um, <laughs> looking into or probing into about Hershey, the, the patron saint of the town. And uh, so I got ca called in one day um, with someone who was the head of Hershey Park, their, their park that was converting to a theme. And they asked if I might want to help Hershey Park as a publicity or PR man. And so uh, I changed from reporter, making $7,500 a year as a reporter, to the PR man for Hershey Park, making $10,000 a year. And I remember telling a fellow reporter at, at Patriot News, boy, can you believe, I'll never have to make any more money than that. <laughs> and uh, of course, I didn't know I was going to marry Susie. <laughs> <laughs> You stole my thunder. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm going to leave that for, yeah, I've got, I've got to leave the good lines for Greg. Sorry. Anyway. But anyway. Um, so I, um, 
I went to Hershey, and uh, then finally, this is going too long, isn't it? Finally, I, while working in PR for Hershey, I went to a conference in Williamsburg, and at, a PR conference, and at that conference, I met a guy by the name of Paul Lazaro, who was director of PR for Marriott, an upstart hotel company headquartered in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And I'd heard of it because I'd been to a property in, outside of Philadelphia called the Philadelphia City Line, or Main Line, Marriott. And it was the, little did I know at the time, it was the third hotel in the company. This was uh, just the beginning. And um, after meeting Paul Lazaro in Williamsburg at this conference, he had a job opening about five months later and contacted me. And we went down to Washington, we interviewed for the job, and uh, he offered me the job and started with Marriott in 1977. You, and also during that time period, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, uh, you met uh, and subsequently married one Susie Connor in Hershey. That's true. How could I leave that out? <laughs> Because that was my job. Yeah, all right, all right. You, yeah, you left your mother out. She doesn't work. You left Susie out. I really <laughs> How am I doing on women? I uh, <laughs> hang in there, women. There's some positives coming up. Anyway, um, no, I uh, I did meet uh, um, while in Hershey. I mean, this is funny stuff. Uh, I, I was. You correct me if I'm wrong. I, you know all these stories, yeah. Um, I was a young PR man for Hershey, and I've always played uh, a lot of tennis. And it was a weekday, the middle of the weekday, uh, you know, during the day on a, on a work day. Which, and, and I was at Hershey Country Club in tennis whites, having, having played tennis, having lunch at Hershey Country Club. And Susie happened to be there as the, uh, I didn't meet her the, on this day, but she was there with a couple who were instrumental in, she, her, she was ending her competitive national and world figure skating career. And uh, in those days, uh, you had to turn from amateur to pro. And she really wasn't interested in ice capades or ice follies. So she became, uh, was interviewed and became the head pro for the Hershey Figure Skating Club, which was a strong, always a strong figure skating town. In fact, Ice Capades was founded. The ice show of long ago was founded in, in Hershey. And so she became the new ice pro in town. And when she was interviewing with that couple who were her friends, she happened to see me <laughs> sitting there in my tennis whites in the middle of the day and uh, asked them, you know, uh, who's that? Uh, and uh, they said, oh, that's Roger Connor. He's, uh, you know, the PR uh, man for, for Herco and Hershey Park. And she said, oh, OK. But we did not meet on that day. And uh, several months later, maybe more than several months, uh, after that couple tried to fix us up, they knew that couple knew me as well, and they kept trying to fix us up on a blind date. And you know, do blind dates are generally death, right? I mean, you don't really want to go on a blind date. They never were, oh yeah, sure. You'd say yes, and then hope it would never happen. And she was saying the same thing on her end. And then one night, there was a little bar in Hershey called Ummies. Uh, and uh, I was in that bar, and Susie was in that bar with a group of people. And I knew a few of those people, and we were introduced, it was like, oh, you're Susie that uh, they've been trying to get me to go on a blind, and she was saying the same thing. So we met in Hershey. She was engaged to, what's it, Jay? Jay Rand, an, uh, an Olympic ski jumper from Lake Placid, fitting, an Olympic quality ice skater. She's engaged to an Olympic ski jumper in Lake Placid. She skated out of Lake Placid a lot. When we met, she was engaged. And so over the course of eight or nine months, I weaned her away or wooed her away from Jay and we ended up getting married in Hershey, Pennsylvania and uh, Chocolate Town, USA and right after we got married, uh, about four or five months later, I, I moved to Washington, D.C. with Marriott. So you're at Marriott, what was, and communications, what's your background? You, we, we understand that, you know, you graduated from Syracuse, Newhouse School, because you strategically dated that lady to get into the Newhouse School. <laughs> uh, I, I like that. that, that's a great story. So, were you in communications? Was that where they slotted you right away? Uh, yes, I was hired, uh, the, I met the Director of Public Relations um, in uh, Williamsburg, and he offered me a job as Public Relations Coordinator. And, uh, Marriott, uh, I think, may have had 10 hotels or a little, you know, a few more than that coming up on that at this time. And uh, they were in a, an older building in, in, in Bethesda, 
on River Road in the Washington, D.C. area. And, uh, and you know, Juanita and John probably know that area. Um, that's a, a story for later. Anyway, um, uh, I interviewed and was offered the job and we took it and we, you know, we moved there and I was public relations coordinator for a, a hotel company that had about 12 to 15 hotels. And, uh, you know, what is, I mean, I, Susie used to say, you know, what do you do at work? I mean, you know, it was, it was always kind of hard to explain. I, I mean, I went off every day and it was before cell phones, so I went to an office and did something. But um, the um, a, a public relation, I, as a, uh, it was very normal then, it still might be today, that if you work in media, like a reporter or a journalist, it was a very easy transfer to move from uh, journalism or working in, in the media world uh, as a reporter or on the editorial side of media to move to a public relations job. In fact, I did that way back in Hershey, uh, if you recall from just a few moments ago. I was a newspaper reporter who they interested in becoming a PR person because one of the fundamentals of PR is writing. Granted, it's not writing a news story, but you're writing news releases or you're writing messages or letters. So the, I would stress for years and probably would still even stress today to all the young people I talk to at Syracuse and others interested in going into the field of PR, have a foundation or uh, have a fundamental knowledge in writing. Writing differently, still writing you know, in, in, in sentence structure than how we all write so quickly in terms of our text messages and all of our little phrases and buzz, buzzwords on, in emails and on the internet. Um, so writing was a strong foundation and as a young PR man at Marriott, I was writing news releases. And I was helping with special events because they were a hotel company. And one of the big things in PR for Marriott was a grand opening of a hotel. And I'll never forget the first grand opening after I was hired was the Bethesda Marriott and I was working on it with Paul Azaro, my boss. And we always tried to do something creative at the grand opening to cut the ribbon or break the ribbon. So I said, ah, creative. So <laughs> right nearby at the University of Maryland, there was an Olympic hurdler by the name of Ronaldo Skeets Nehemiah. He won the Olympic high hurdles. This might have been right after it or right before, but he was already going to be in the, I think it might have been after he won the, but he went on to be a star wide receiver for the San Francisco 49ers, maybe some other teams. But his name was Ronaldo Skeets Nehemiah. And I said, let's line up Ronaldo, see if he's available, to clear some hurdles and break the ribbon <laughs> to open the hotel. Well, Paul Azaro, my boss, he couldn't believe I came up. I mean, he said, he was like, he never said, he said, I must have hired the right guy. I mean, Paul Azaro loved that kind of stuff. So I was off literally and running with Ronaldo Skeets Nehemiah on my first grand opening. How did it actually work? Did he, I mean, did he kind of do a couple of hurdles and then on the run, clip the ribbon? What, what, no, no, no. He cleared a couple of hurdles and broke the ribbon like you would break the tape oh, at the finish gosh. of the race. So. The ribbon, we, we had to make sure that the ribbon uh, was breakable as compared to, you know, and, 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 uh, that reminds me of another grand opening shortly thereafter that I'll tell you in a moment. But, but yeah, Ronaldo Skeets Nehemiah, we had a ribbon that he could break. It was crepe enough or whatever that he could run right through it. And uh, that's how we cut the ribbon for the Bethesda Marriott. And um, we'll talk about the other ribbon story that... Well, the other, uh, you know, years, uh, not, no, about a year later, or maybe a year or two later, um, it was another grand opening at the, um, uh, just outside of Baltimore. I uh, can't think of the area. It's a suburban area right north of Baltimore. Mm, it's a Hunt Valley. Hunt Valley. Thank you, honey. I, thank you very much. Um, the Hunt Valley Marriott, which is just north of Baltimore. We... Um, we were doing the grand opening and the stunt to, to break the ribbon for the grand opening was that we had hired a person who puts on a straight jacket, get, gets himself into a straight jacket. And, and in this case, we did the grand, grand opening at poolside. And he gets on a straight jacket and he jumps in the pool and he gets out of the straight jacket and come, pops up out of the water and breaks the ribbon. Oh 
Well, um, it was a great plan. Every bit as creative as Ronaldo Skeets Nehemiah, if not more so and crazy, just not as famous as Ronaldo Skeets Nehemiah. And we're off, and the guy, you know, goes in the pool, and he, he's in there quite a while. And I think, man, this guy can really hold his breath. <laughs> And, the, and the, you know, there, there are dignitaries and there's a crowd always invited for the grand opening, you know, the mayor and other officials and people involved with it. So we're all, the people are all around the pool and now we know. So, so next thing we know, some person, I think it was like a, a pool aide or something with a swimming pool or somebody, an employee with a, a hotel, jumps in and we have to save uh, this guy. <laughs> Because he, he never really got out of the straight check. And, you know, talk about, you know, we always did these stunts to get, I forgot to mention, we always did these things to get media coverage. We, our goal was to get the front page of the local paper. And that's why instead of just cutting the ribbon with scissors, we tried to do something more creative. And there's a host of those stories over 34 years that you can't believe. But this, the media coverage from the Hunt Valley Marriott was stronger than any I've ever gotten. <laughs> But it was about a, almost killing a guy in the name of grand opening a hotel. Now this is the Marriott Hotel, and obviously it's it's named after its founder, Marriott. Talk about the Marriott family. That's great. Um, they are an incredible uh, American family, American success story, like so many others. Um, you probably know they're from uh, they're a Utah family. They are Mormon. Um, most of the people that work at Marriott are not Mormon. I mean, I'm, no, I'm not Mormon, and many, I, I knew there were two or three people maybe at Marriott that were Mormon that I knew. But they were a well known Mormon family. And J. Willard Marriott, fascinating story, and his wife, uh, Alice Marriott, were, um, J. Willard anyway, was born on a sheep farm near Ogden, Utah. And um, they, he, he, they got married. Uh, he met Alice Sheets. S-H-E-E-T-S, -E -E and they got married. And back in those days, you know, well, today to this day, um, uh, Mormons go on a mission. And when uh, J. Willard Marriott, who went by Bill, went on his mission, it was to New England. And on his way back from New England, he went through Washington, D.C. to see the nation's capital and the Capitol building. And one of the things he noticed, that along with all the monuments and the buildings, back in that summer, it was in the summer of, of uh, 1927, or maybe it was earlier, it was a summer time, and he noticed how hot and sticky it was, and that all the vendors that were doing well were selling out of lemonade and cold drinks right and left in the summer. So he went back to Utah and got married, and the family knew uh, the Allen of A and W, do you know A and W root beer? Does everybody know A and W? Well, that was there were two family members. One of them was Allen, A L L E N, and I've never learned what the W was that started A and W root beer. And the Marriott family, as sheep farmers in Utah, somehow knew I don't, I don't know where the Allen of A and W, uh, and J Willard Marriott, Bill Marriott, got an A and W franchise for Washington D.C and went to D.C. and opened that on May 20th, I think Greg will recall this, May 20th, 1927, a nine-seat root beer, A&W root beer stand in Washington, D.C. And uh, it was the same day. Anybody know? Uh, maybe Greg does because he heard me speak some years ago. What else happened on May 20th, 1927? Lindbergh. Yeah, Lindbergh flew the Atlantic on that day, and J. Willard Marriott opened up his nine-seat root, nine, uh, root beer stand in Washington. And I guess uh, franchising wasn't, uh, uh, then wasn't like it is today. When it got cold, their sales fell off. And so Allie, his wife, Alice, introduced some um, Mex hot items, some Mexican food items, some tamales and other things that she learned from uh, a friend chef at the uh, Mexican embassy. And she started selling them. And they were able to change the name from whatever it was, they ended up to the hot shop. And uh, for you for, uh, in New York, you probably never heard of it. But over the years, hot shop 
in Washington, D.C., and also Baltimore and Philadelphia, became a restaurant chain of, ver you know, a, a very good reputation and very well known. And that's what Marriott was. It incorporated in 1953, um, and I think it may have sold stock for the first time, as Hot Shops, not Marriott. And the Marriott part comes in a little later. Just want me to... Sure, perhaps this is fascinating. All righty, so... Uh, That's your job, right? Yes, indeed. I'm the, I'm the PR guy for Marriott. I mean, how lucky can you be? I mean, you know, coming out of central Pennsylvania, um, I never envisioned uh, that happening to me. But um, they, in, in 1957, they had a piece of land right outside uh, National Airport, uh, which is in Virginia, just across the river from Washington, D.C., I'm sure many of you know. Um, in uh, not, uh, maybe it's Arlington or Alexandria. I think it's Alexandria, that National Airport. And the land became available, and J. Willard Marriott and Bill Marriott, who is his son and really ran the company, which uh, you know, I'll get into maybe a little later, for over all the years to grow it, Bill Marriott, J. Willard Marriott's son, J. Willard Marriott Jr., if you will, he thought it would be good for a hotel. And J. Willard Marriott said, no. Hotels are too risky. They're too capital intensive. Um, we're not going to make any money. You've got to have a huge staff. We should never do a hotel. And his son said, Dad, I think we'll do a hotel there. Uh, we'll make it nice. Uh, it'll be, have all the modern conveniences. And uh, so his father gave in and let Bill Jr., or J. Willard Marriott, John Willard Marriott Jr., do a hotel there. And that was the first one, the Twin Bridges Marriott in 1957. Um, I've run it, I ran into a lot of people over the years, older people, older folks, who uh, were coming from Canada to Florida. And their first day stop would be at that Twin Bridges Marriott in Washington, D.C. There, And Susie, who grew up in Michigan, her parents on the way to Florida stopped at the Twin Bridges Marriott they Hotel. And they had an ice rink. So it was perfect for Susie. Uh, who could believe? So they had a swimming pool that they converted to an ice rink uh, as in the winter when people were heading to Florida. Anyway, that was the first. Two years later, they opened the Key Bridge Marriott Hotel in 1959, right across from Georgetown. There's a bridge that leads from Georgetown into Virginia. You can walk very short walk across the bridge. And um, right at the base of that bridge, they opened the Key Bridge Marriott in 59. Those were the first two. So as, as it progressed, when you enter the Marriott world in 1977, how many hotels, I know they had different styles and chains within it, but how many were there at the time? You know, what, what was the capacity? When I, when I joined? Yeah. yeah, they were, um, as I said, I think they were coming up between 15 and 20 hotels. They had uh, just, they had opened one international hotel in Amsterdam. That was their first international. Uh, you had uh, Twin Bridges in 57 outside of D.C. and Key Bridge in 59, you know, right just across Georgetown in D.C. <laughs> and then the next one, uh, was uh, the Philadelphia Marriott City Line. And the fourth one of all th places was in Dallas, Texas, which really took them out of their, you know, closer neighborhoods. They, they knew Philadelphia from having hot shop restaurants there, but they had no hot shop restaurants in Dallas. So that really took them more uh, in, into a nationwide path. And uh, they had opened one in Amsterdam. And when I arrived, uh, they were um, opening, uh, let's see, uh, in... Uh, where was it? I think in Mexico City, and I wasn't there soon enough to get in on that grand opening. And, um, and of course, uh, shortly after I arrived, as I mentioned, they were doing the Bethesda Marriott in their, right in their backyard. Their headquarters was in Bethesda Marriott. And, um, and then they started growing by leaps and bounds. And the company, company's rise, I mean, I, I pinched myself now and then. It was meteoric. I, I mean, it, at they, first, they were just opening Marriott's. That was their only brand. They had Marriott hotels, and they were opening Marriott hotels. And they would buy the real estate, and they would own the real estate, and they would own the hotel, and they would own everything in it. And they, that's how you, all of you would probably think you would do a hotel. But then, lo and behold, they started doing other things. They said, and they moved now. You fast forward into the um, early 80s. And they decided to develop, develop a mid-priced hotel called 
courtyard on their own. They wanted to go after Holiday Inn. Uh, meanwhile, J, uh, J. Willard Marriott and, uh, oh, I'm going to forget his name, maybe someone n here knows, and the founder of Holiday Inn became good friends. But, any, but anyway, uh, they, they, uh, they, were a head, uh, they were a Memphis-based hotel company. Kemen, Ke Kemens Wilson was the founder of Holiday Inn, and maybe not Wilson, but it's Kemens something. And uh, he and Bill Marriott were close friends, but also rivals. So they wanted to uh, get a mid-priced product to go after Holiday Inn, and they created Courtyard. And then just to speed through this a little bit, a few years later, they wanted an economy-priced hotel. So they developed Fairfield Inn. In between the two, they decided they wanted a long-term stay hotel. I mean, I was at Marriott and entrenched by now. I think I was director of PR, if not vice president. Um, they found a, um, what they call a... Uh, a long-term stay company called Residence Inn. It was started in uh, St. Louis. Uh, once again, my mind's uh, giving up on me by a guy by the name of Jack something. <laughs> and Marriott bought, he, they didn't create residence, but they bought Residence Inn. So they started Courtyard, they started Fairfield Inn, they bought Residence Inn. And then just to go through this pattern, how they grew over the years, in 1995, they bought Rich Carlton. Does anyone here know that Rich Carlton is owned by Marriott? They, they try to keep that quiet. <laughs> I mean, Marriott means good things, to, uh, but, I mean, it's a, but it's a Buick, whereas Rich Carlton is a Cadillac. So you don't say Rich Carlton by Marriott. But when we were starting Courtyard, it was Courtyard by Marriott because Marriott was the good housekeeping seal of approval to let people know Marriott stood behind it and Fairfield Inn by Marriott. Marriott was the same um, endorser brand, if you will, for Fairfield Inn. But with Rich Carlton, it was just Rich Carlton. No reference to Marriott. Uh, I need to uh, tell you an incredible uh, story about Rich Carlton. It was started by a guy by the name of Bill, well, not started, but it was bought in 1983. The Boston Rich Carlton, which was the only one in the U.S., was bought by a guy by the name of Bill Johnson. Anybody know who Bill Johnson is? Anyone? Have, I mean, a lot of people probably know someone named Bill Johnson. Such a guy. <laughs> he was from Atlanta. Bill Johnson, before he bought the Boston Ritz Carlton, you have any idea what he did? Coca-Cola. Pardon? Coca-Cola. Well, that's good in Atlanta. It wasn't not near as high, as high end or upscale as Coca-Cola and, and big. Bill Johnson had created a chain of uh, little sort of. Caf cafeteria restaurants up and down Interstate 95 at exits. The Waffle House. You must have seen Waffle Houses if you've ever driven 95. Bill Johnson was the founder and owner and creator of Waffle Houses. A more unlikely person to be the owner of Ritz Carlton. They are at opposite ends of the pole. Uh, but anyway, he got into hotels in Ritz Carlton, and then Marriott bought it from him in 1995. And uh, Marriott bought Renaissance Hotels in 1996. And on and on it went with creating brands and buying brands. And of course, just last year, Marriott bought a hotel company. Um, 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 what's the name? Uh, Starwood. Thank you. What would I do without you? I knew you had to come. <laughs> I mean, this is a well-known hotel company. I'm just getting so old. But Marriott bought Starwood Hotels last year, which they don't have any hotels that operate under that name. But you might know Weston and Sheraton and W and a whole lot of others. And Marriott was already arguably the largest hospitality hotel company in the world. After they bought Starwood last year, clearly, they now have um, over 600, uh, uh, over, um, I guess 650,000 uh, ho uh, hotels, or no, not hotels, but they have, uh, they have um, well over uh, 300,000 rooms in, uh, in close to, I guess, over 10,000 hotels worldwide. And they um, own 30 brands. I mean, I can't even name all of Marriott's brands, but it goes from Ritz Carlton, to J.W. Marriott, to Renaissance, to Courtyard, to Fairfield Inn, to Residence Inn, to Spring Hill Suites, to Town Place Suites, to AC Hotels, to now Wyndham and Sheraton 
and W. You know, it's impossible for you to get out there and not stay in a Marriott almost. <laughs> it's only competitors uh, big time with brands that you might also stay in are Hilton and, um, uh, and, in, and Intercontinental, which owns Holiday Inn and Holiday Inn Express. Uh, there's some others, but those are the big players. And the guy that runs Hilton is a Marriott guy who I knew for years, Chris Nassetta. He grew up in Marriott, and then he just moved on finally to go run Hilton. So the touch points of Marriott are incredible. So as you said during your uh, uh, monologue there. <laughs> <laughs> Shot number one. <laughs> it was great. It was great. But you were talking about... Uh, the Marriott constantly looking to do other things. And it wasn't uh, like in 2007, I was reading, because you pointed me in the direction of a lot of stuff online. Uh, Romney, who was a uh, very Republican presidential contender, who uh, rails against the cesspool of pornography, was on the board of Marriott. And Marriott was uh, deemed to be a major pornographer. And one of the guys who had to come to the defense of Marriott and board member Romney was one Marriott spokesman, Roger Connor. <laughs> Tell me about how that all played out. Well, now we're really getting into the good stuff, aren't we? Uh, Marriott as pornographer, and, uh, and it's true, if you search Roger Connor Marriott, you can't put in just my name, but if you search Roger Connor Marriott, uh, yeah, I'm kind of the, the, the king of, of uh, commenters on, on porn. Um, <laughs> What, what a, what a, uh, what a uh, you know, great accolade to bear after 34 years uh, as vice president of PR for America. But um, just to quickly, more quickly than the last monologue, uh, cover it. Uh, the um, adult uh, hotels showed adult movies on their in-room TVs. They didn't show them, but you could access them remote control pad, you could make a selection, I want to watch, you can watch movies, but then in addition to a lot of great first run features, you could also watch adult movies. And Marriott was not alone in this. Every hotel, almost, you know, the Hiltons, the Hyatts, the Sheratons at that time before it was owned by Starwood, um, the Holiday, every hotel basically had adult movie offerings. And Marriott had them as well. And uh, uh, since we were so big, even then, a, there was a coalition, a religious right coalition. Think uh, family, what's the um, Colorado-based Tony? Uh, Tony Perkins. Tony Perkins based in, in, in Colorado. Think that organization. And about 60 more like it and some major clergy. Uh, Baptist, uh, there was a major, major clergyman uh, representing the Baptist church. Anyway, they all decided that they were going to boycott Marriott and we had to get the uh, adult movies out of our rooms. And that's when the story started to appear and I had to defend it. Uh, basically, uh, the comment, the PR comment went something along the lines of this. We have a lot of, hot a lot of uh, offerings on our TV sets. Uh, we have children's offerings, we have uh, first-run motion pictures, and then along with that we also have uh, an adult offering, but we have a lot to choose from. And anyone who does not want to view or have children in the room that does not want to, would not want to have seen any adult material, all they need to do is block that using the remote pad, or if that's too difficult for you, call the front desk and they will remove that material so it cannot be seen by anyone in your room. Well, that might have been <laughs> fine for our statement. That didn't satisfy the uh, coalition of religious right organizations. So they wanted a meeting with us. And to make a long story short, we met with them in Washington. I met with them. Um, I remember the uh, talk about an amazing opening. They're on one side of the table. And I'm on the other side, flanked by very, uh, a lawyer from Marriott, to try to keep me out of trouble, and others. And... Um, to, as the meeting was about to begin, after some pleasantries, the, I don't forget the guy's name, it wasn't Tony Perkins, because uh, he sent a representative by the name of Tom Minery, who was a big VP uh, with uh, Tony's organization. But the guy in the middle of the table, when we were ready to start, he, said, he, looks, he looks up and he looks at me and he says, so tell me, what are you going to do about the porn? That's how he started the meeting. <laughs> I was looking for something a little bit more intellectual or a little bit more thought-provoking or a little bit more business-like, but uh, what are you gonna do with the porn? So, um, 
by the way, we uh, told them that we would uh, work harder. We would talk with our owners. We explained that it was uh, our owners. Pe Marriott no longer owned all of the hotels. Marriott was the management company. It was our brand. The brand was everything. People s stood in line to get a Marriott name on their hotel or a courtyard name, and they owned the hotel. We no longer had to own the real estate. So this was a matter that we would have to discuss with our owners because they made the revenue from those movies. Marriott International, the company, did ne never saw any direct revenue from the adult movies, but the property owners did. Now, you might say, if you're knowledgeable about that, but wait a minute, people are staying in those rooms, and if you pull those adult movies, maybe they wouldn't stay with you. That could have been the case. Uh, they wouldn't have stayed as frequently, and we would have lost some money if room revenue uh, started to drop. But anyway, we uh, talked to owners. We, we never actually pulled adult movies. And lo and behold, some years later, um, adult, rather magnanimously, Marriott decided to remove adult movies. But it was at the time that they beginning to no longer make any revenue because the internet and people's uh, iPads and laptops uh, had become the place where any guest would view that kind of material if they wanted to see it. So um, uh, adult movies and hotel rooms, if they're still there, are kind of uh, moot point these days. This story, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but at this particular instance, it also got caught up not only Marriott, but also Mitt Romney. Being oh, yeah. a board member sure. and being a Mormon and a board member of Marriott. So you were kind of defending the Marriott brand, but also somewhat dragged into representing or presenting uh, on a view towards this, about this board member. Yeah, that's true. The, um, the, the Mitt Romney situation, he was a member of the Marriott board, um, a well known uh, family member to the Marriott's, uh, fellow Mormon. Um, by the way, uh, uh, Mitt Romney's uh, first name or middle name, it might actually be, I think it might be his, his first name. I, I think it's W. Mitt Romney. His first name is Willard in honor of J. Willard Marriott. That's how close uh, George Romney and J. Willard Marriott uh, were friendly. And so uh, Mitt Romney uh, was a family friend uh, and um, an obvious member of our board. Uh, when he was not governor of Massachusetts. Uh, he had to step off when he became governor of Massachusetts. But um, this, uh, some attacks on Mitt uh, about uh, being part of Marriott profiting from pornography came up and um, being part of the board of Marriott and why did he not do something about that? And uh, there's an article that Greg has probably seen and you could also find on Google where um, I was commenting on that situation, and actually, Mitt and Bill Marriott even, although Bill Marriott sort of smiled at the end, Bill Marriott got a little bit upset with my comment because I said something along the lines, I don't know if Greg uh, has the article, but I said something along the lines that uh, while Mitt as a board member certainly may hold to some opinions uh, of disapproval about uh, any pornography or any material of that nature, uh, he, in his board member role, he would not necessarily, I don't think it was, I, I didn't say entitled, but he would not be able to uh, impart his personal views onto a matter of financial impact to the company, such as these movies. So uh, obviously Mitt Romney didn't like my comment too much. and. Uh, <laughs> And Bill Marriott said, you know, uh, I, you know, he didn't approve that comment. W who did? He, I said, well, somebody else, one, a lawyer approved it. <laughs> but uh, I didn't just say it. Uh, and, and Bill Marriott said, well, it's fine, Roger. But um, <laughs> By the way, what you said, well, very close. It certainly would have been wrong to impose his personal beliefs if they were contrary to the financial interests of the company. That's Correct. the obligation of a board member. Correct. So that became a little uh, sticky for Mitt, and uh, you know, time moved on like it always does, uh, and that issue. But yeah, uh, Marriott uh, no longer offers adult movies. I don't think many of the major uh, companies do, because uh, people uh, no longer pay for them or access them. They, they uh, use their own uh, internet. 
So you're, you're deemed an expert in crisis management for the hospitality business. And uh, um, among the variety of things, I'd like you to just comment on a few is September 11th. What did September 11th, 2001 mean to Roger Connor and Mary? It was, it was uh, you know, perhaps the most, as you might imagine, I dealt with a lot of crisis situations. And I became much more of a crisis communicator in terms of uh, knowledge and aptitude and skill than a marketing communicator. I mean, most PR people, and I had a foot in each camp, but most PR people are there trying to publicize and, and, um, and, bec and generate more publicity and goodwill for, in this case, the Marriott brand or all of its portfolio of brands, trying to, trying to get, make news, trying to get, make good news. The crisis camp is the opposite, and because of who we were and the nature of hotels, uh, I became quite an authority. But the most demanding and most brutal challenge of all of my crisis communication situations over the years, and I certainly will mention a few others here in a moment, um, was 9-11. The Marriott World Trade Center Hotel was in between the two towers. That morning, I was on my way to work. Uh, I only lived about 10 minutes from Marriott headquarters in Bethesda. And I got a call in my car. And one of the, remember those original car phones that it was a great big box of some sort that sat between you and the, and, a, and the phone set in a box. Well, I had that kind of phone, and I got a call from Judy Hadfield, who was our vice president of community relations, a colleague of mine. And uh, Judy said, did you hear? And I, ha I mean, you know, I didn't have it on or I hadn't seen it. She said, uh, Roger, I just wanted to let you know some kind of small aircraft, so some sort of small plane, um, crashed this morning uh, into one of the um, World Trade Center towers in New York. She, had, she had, did not yet know or had not yet heard, and there was no report yet of what the situation was. And so she said, I just wanted to let you know, Roger, before you get to the office, since, you know, we have a hotel nearby, maybe we can help out or do something. We usually stepped up in the face of uh, a demand for hotel rooms or to help out in the crisis. So that's my initial finding on 9-11. And then I arrived at the office and into the day that all of us lived and all of us remember that was even more horrifying for me because we did have a hotel between. And we set up our crisis communication center. Uh, I mean, we went to our crisis communication center room at Marriott headquarters. We uh, had the resident manager of the hotel and a bellman at that hotel on the line. They were still in the hotel at a, at, a, at a lower level near the entrance. Um, all guests had been cleared from the hotel, from stairways and whatever other means necessary, as far as we knew. A lot of guests had left the hotel in the morning to go into the towers for meetings. So they didn't die in our hotel, but unfortunately they may have died in the towers. Um, but to this day, we know of no deaths, guest deaths in the hotel. We had cleared the hotel. But while we had, while there was still a second hit that came, and while there was still, after that second hit, the falling of those two towers, our resident manager and the bellman were in the hotel, and then we had them on the line, an open line. We're working with them for a couple of hours, or maybe an hour and a half. And uh, that line went dead. And uh, there was a collapse that fell on the hotel and collapsed our hotel. And both of those people, our people, were killed um, trying to uh, handle the situation for us. You know, you can imagine the, the, the impact and mood in that crisis communications room at Marriott once it started to dawn on us that uh, that's why they were no longer talking with us. Uh, in, Marriott, in Marriott's lobby today, there's the flag from that hotel the American flag that was all found and all tattered, and a major memorial to those two individuals, the resident manager and the bellman, who were, who were killed as they tried to stay and make sure everyone was out of our hotel and safe. Um, just an amazing, demanding day. I mean, we would, one of the things that I would do in dealing with the media in, is try to correct information or update information. And you know, on, on TVs, they have that scroll. You're often, today it's even, you see it everywhere, but then it was becoming popular. The scroll that would go across the bottom of the screen. And there was some information on there about our hotel that was inaccurate. And I remember trying to get to that network. I forget it was NBC or CBS or ABC, major network. And you couldn't believe how hard it was to get to the right desk and the right people in the face 
to get that changed. You know, they, I mean, it was inaccurate, uh, and it was and they finally said, well, you know, we'll, we'll get it changed, and it took forever to get the information corrected. There was another story that Susie knows um, about a, a guy during the day, I mean, I was sort of handling high-level media calls and, and other situational calls, and other people were handling other kinds of calls, and someone became so demanding on the phone that they had moved it up to me and said, Roger, would you, would you speak to this gentleman? He's, he's just, you know, is demanding to speak. So I get on the phone, and this gentleman is in Philadelphia, and I guess he had traveled there for the, uh, by train, and he says to me, he said, uh, uh, you know, I would like to know a status on my car. <laughs> now, <coughs> his car was parked in the underground parking of the Marriott World Trade Center. And he wanted to know in the face of all of this, a status on his car. And I, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if it would have gotten me in trouble. I just said, sir, your, your car is gone. And I, and I hung up. <laughs> but uh, it just goes to show you, I mean, when it comes to things that people are concerned about, how shallow and insensitive um, they can be. Uh, anyway, that was the most demanding. But the litany of crisis communications, because you were a hotel company. I mean, there are all kind of other products and companies that don't have as many crises. But uh, I was in New York at the Marriott Marquis in 1989, speaking on crisis communications at the Marriott Marquis. I came back to my room, the f little red light was on on the phone. I got the message. And at the New York Marriott East Side Hotel, just across town, Rabbi Meir Kahani, a very controversial and strongly opinionated rabbi who was speaking at the New York Marriott East Side in a ballroom, was assassinated that night after his speech. Some, as, they, as the people came up to shake hands with Rabbi Meir Kahani, someone came up and shot him point blank and killed him. And I went right, I was asked to go right over to that hotel to help them with that situation in the media. When I got there, it was like a movie set. There were some steps leading up to the entrance to the hotel, and the television cameras and the lights and the media were blaring. I couldn't believe it. And that was a night of responding to U.S. and international media, a lot of international media, about the assassination. Later on, his wife sued Marriott. Uh, for lack of proper uh, safety and security, knowing that he would have been speaking there. Uh, but um, Manuel Noriega, a name you probably remember, out of Panama, he ruled it for years and it was an, an, uh, 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 praised or at least uh, uh, an assistance, if you will, uh, to America. But that turned and when, um, when we invaded and Noriega's troops were doing this, that, the other in Panama, they took over, they invaded, his troops invaded the Panama Marriott and took it over and held all the guests hostages. And in those days, we had to open up a phone line with AT&T, they came into our headquarters, they opened up a phone line for me to speak to a resident manager who was hiding, but still on a phone, not in his office, in the hotel. And he was communicating with us about the situation while Noriega was holding the hotel hostage. And um, media members from ABC and CBS and NBC were taken out of the hotel as hostages. Um, John Quinones, anyone recall that media person? He was still in the hotel, <laughs> not taken as a hostage. And his wife, in New York was on the line to us trying to find out if John was safe, and we didn't know. Um, anyway, it was just a crazy crisis situation, and eventually American troops came in to save the hotel and rescue, you know, release it from the hostage situation, and when they entered the room that this resident manager had been in with the phone, and we had an open phone line, you literally could hear the army or whatever personnel talking to one another. Oh, is this secure? Is this safe? They were yelling at each other. And then I finally said, uh, this is uh, Ro Roger Connor uh, at Marriott headquarters. Can you hear? 
like there was dead silence. And, and, and you, I just pictured this. They were turning the rifles to shoot or something. <laughs> they wondered who in the hell is this voice? But there was an open speaker and phone line in the room. And eventually they uh, believed what it was and uh, told, mentioned they were in the process of securing and um, making safe all the guests. Didn't spend much time with me. They could have cared less about what I was <laughs> trying to do. But um, that and, and uh, you know, the Islamabad, uh, Pakistan, killing of 54 people, bombing in the London Marriott Let's lobby. Let's talk about the, that, that Islamabad. Okay, great. Lots of, lots of crises that, like it or not, um, we de I became good at and we developed plans for. And um, it was all in the name of, of uh, when I would go around speaking, I would say hotels are like any city or any town, sort of a, a smaller version. Whatever goes on in a city on any given night or in a town on any given night also can, doesn't always, usually hotel stays are very, Nice, people love hotels, say. But whatever goes on in a city or town on any given night can also go on in a hotel. From uh, criminal activity, a lot of people go into hotel rooms for criminal activity. A lot of people commit suicide in hotel rooms, unfortunately. And on and on it goes. So uh, drug deals would come down in hotel rooms. So those were the kinds of things. What about security? At what point does, does Roger Connor, Marriott, because ultimately, it's you're, you're encouraging usage of a physical facility for your pleasure, relaxation, and security. When, does the, when did that become part of the vocabulary? You just normally, in the old days, never thought of that. Yeah. Security, uh, security became increasingly important over the years as the world we live in confronted the kinds of things that 9-11 brought us and might have brought us beforehand. There was always security need at a hotel, but it was ramped up considerably as the world became uh, more of a, of a crisis incubator. And, uh, and, uh, and there were more uh, people intent uh, upon harming uh, American uh, sites or American branded sites like American, and knew where the people were. So, uh, I, we certainly uh, moved in accordance with that. We created massive security uh, and crisis communications and crisis plans. Crisis communications, by the way, is a subset of a crisis plan. An overall crisis plan includes more than communications. Um, and we, had, we hired larger staffs. And we also, at certain hotels, like the New York Marriott Marquis, started to inspect cars with a device that you can put underneath the car that pulled into the Port Cachere to drop off people as they pulled up to the Marriott Marquis and other major city hotels like New York uh, instituted that. But uh, the, uh, the Cairo Marriott, we were there, uh, Susie and I, it was the first hotel where I ever saw armed guards at the entrance to the hotel. Remember, uh, to Gre as Greg hinted, Hotels are a fun experience. It is all about hospitality. You come in there for a great room, maybe a great restaurant, for a great meeting, for a great experience. For, uh, you know, it was beginning to be an experience where you could go to a hot tub or a spa or the indoor pool. Um, so you did not want to make people think about anything going wrong or anything, uh, you know, uh, any uh, bomb. You didn't want them to think of that. You didn't want them to think of any uh, chemical substance being released. You didn't want to. So to this day, there are still an awful lot of hotels where you don't have the same kind of screening that you do at airports. You, you know, there are a few hotels in, in, in markets internationally where, where you have to go through that kind of security clearing. But it's a, it's a thin line and, and a balance that we try to walk. We try to do all the security behind the scenes in good enough fashion to make as, it as secure, the hotel secu as secure as it can be without impacting the customer in a way that takes away from their hospitality experience. So Roger, uh, you were on YouTube. I watched you today and you had given a speech and they talked, they asked you about Marriott's, at the time, you uh, five point crisis or five part crisis communication team and could you, you, you want to do a kind of a two minute piece on that yeah geez if i can remember all five i remember i watched the same video to prep but I'm, but anyway uh 
How'd you look? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, yeah, I, I, I looked fine, but obviously my, my, my mind was not visible on camera, and now it's, uh, you know, uh, not working to perhaps remember. No, it was a five-part plan. It started with, but before the five parts, uh, or maybe it was included in what I mentioned on the video, we created something called the First 15. And this was a document that in all uh, honesty, whether it was uh, in reality or just in, uh, by intention, were all of the things that we would do in the first, teen minute, the first 15 minutes of a crisis. What you would do right away. Basically, crisis communications and crisis management becomes a matter of knowing exactly what you need to do should you be confronted by a crisis, and then who are the people that need to do it. There's a whole lot of other details, but it starts with laying out what you need to do right away and who's the people, who are the people that need to do it. And the first 15 minute document nailed some things right away that we had to do. And certainly as digital and internet media became more omnipresent, we had to be ready right away there with a comment posted right away. Uh, the second thing and the more uh, the document that dealt with more reality was the first hour document. And then on that document, we really, whether it ran longer or shorter than 15 minutes or not, we really did everything in the first hour that was in that document. And there was a team. Um, the, one of the teams was the, the writers and gatherers. And they would gather information about the event or the hotel right away and write up initially what the situation was and what, ne what they thought needed to be said. The second team was a media team. Usually writing and talking to the media or, or, or working with the media is done by the same person. We split that duty. Writers and gatherers over here, when you're done, give it to the media team who talk to the media. Because you don't get to just read your statement and they say goodbye. You know what the media is like. They're going to question you. So that media person would not only be ready uh, with the statement, but also to respond to their questions. Uh, and then we had uh, the uh, legal team which is absolutely essential to pre-identify, have lawyers on your crisis team and on your crisis communication team so they could clear everything right away for use. And we also had a human resource team that dealt with making sure all of our people and any other appropriate audience outside the company than the media, owners, um, contractors, vendors, were properly communicated with. And then finally, there was a fifth audience, and that was logistics. I think I might have remembered all of them. I'm, J yeah, Greg can help me later. And logistics was a team that really did most of their work in advance, and then they had to refresh during uh, the um, onset and during the handling of the crisis. And that was everything from equipment and faxes and, and, and uh, paper and phone lines and uh, refreshments for the people that couldn't get away from their desk. The logistics team handled all that. So at Marriott pioneered, and we had this in kind of a Bible, a crisis communications plan. And uh, I still have a copy of that here in my Chautauqua cottage. Uh, and um, it, it, it was very thorough, to say the least. And, uh, and it's, how, it, it's how you had to address crisis, even more so today. Talk about crisis, uh, the name of the, the brand is Marriott. Correct. And therefore, it, that happens to be a name of a family, a family which uh, has a, uh, un, until recently, an unblemished uh, uh, public Rep relations. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you get uh, headlines like this, Marriott heir sues dad <laughs> for booting him from family trust over divorce. Bill Marriott responds to son's lawsuit alleging erratic drug-fueled behavior. At what point does that become a Marriott hotel uh, piece as opposed to just a Bill Marriott uh, personal issue? Well, the risk is complete uh, and full uh, all the time in terms of affecting the brand. The Marriott family name, and we're glad to have the Marriott family, and we were glad for years to have uh, a Marriott run the company. We always thought there was benefit in, in a, the name that's on the door 
is also a person that's running the company. We felt that added to how people valued the Marriott brand and trusted the Marriott brand. But as, uh, as mentioned earlier, um, as a Mormon family, there, were, there was a lot of controversy and a lot of groups that attacked Marriott as a Mormon, which you know, needed to be defended uh, to benefit the brand. And um, there were many, uh, it, was, it was always, any, anything that was at risk for J.W. Marriott Jr. individually could also impact the brand because it bore and bears the same name. Not all the hotels, but people basically know courtyards and fairfields and residence in, particularly since it says by Marriott or part of Marriott. So it affects the whole company. Uh, in what Greg is referencing right here, that's a relatively recent uh, situation. Uh, I did not have to handle that under the employ of Marriott, but um, um, J. Willard Marriott, the founder, had two sons, uh, J. Willard Marriott Jr., his oldest, and Richard Marriott, uh, two sons. J. Willard Marriott Jr., who went by Bill Marriott over all the years and now is 86 years old, he was the young guy under J. Willard Marriott that grew the hotel company to, from uh, about $90 million, which was pretty large, when he took it over, when, when his father gave him the reins, it was 90 million. He grew it to somewhere between 20 and 30 billion and to 120 uh, hotels in 127 countries. So Bill Marriott, uh, who's 86 today, is the main man. His children are as follows. First child, Debbie Marriott, daughter. Sharpest child in the family. Perhaps I have uh, earned <laughs> my stripes with the women finally in this audience. Um, Debbie Marriott was the oldest, but perhaps uh, as part of a, a Marriott, I mean a, a Mormon family philosophy, or for some other reason, Debbie Marriott, his oldest child and daughter, never moved into the company. Uh, she didn't work in the company. She married a, a gentleman who worked in the company and they had um, four or five children, but she worked with her children at home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, after Debbie Marriott, the next child was Stephen Marriott, first son for, to Bill Marriott. Uh, it's Bill Marriott Jr., if you will, who's uh, the main man running the company. Stephen Marriott uh, was the first son. He was born in fine health, but by age um, seven or eight and then onward into his teenage years and beyond, he had severe hearing and um, speaking and sight disabilities, mainly hearing and sight disabilities that were going to get worse and worse. And uh, he died some um, five years ago now. I mean, I can't believe it's that long. Stephen Marriott is, is no longer living. The next son after Stephen was, is John Marriott. And his name is John Willard Marriott the third. Now a couple of things have always puzzled me and I've never asked Bill Marriott senior who I mean junior but who is 86 now who was my boss when I was at Marriott that I have never I never understood. You had J. Willard Marriott that founded the company. You had J. Willard Marriott Jr. his son uh, one of two sons who came into the company and ran it and is the main man for growing the company to what it is today. And then you have that person's firstborn child who is named Stephen Marriott. Perfectly fine born son, no disabilities when he was born. How come the first son was named Stephen Marriott? Um, they didn't know he was going to run in the, to, uh, no one knew he would run into these severe hearing and sight disabilities. That would have pre uh, prevented him from ever being able to run the company. So uh, to this day, I've never asked Bill Marriott and I don't know why the first child was named Stephen. The second child was named John Willard Marriott III. And he was working his way up the company and he was fine and he was, he was married to a, a lovely young lady, Angie, and they had children and they were uh, 
uh, you know, a very handsome couple. And he was r rising up through the company the way uh, all of Bill Marriott's children uh, would, except for Debbie, the daughter. Uh, and, um, and there was a third, there was one final son after John, the fourth child of, of Bill and Donna Marriott, David Marriott. To, he came 10 years after the first three, and he was a problem child by any standard, but certainly by Mormon family standards. Uh, David, as a young man, was into drinking and drugs, and, what, and he was always, and I think Bill and, Mar Bill and Donna, at least Bill, allowed himself at one point to say, since it came 10 years later, like, something like, we should have stopped after, you know, three. Stay there a moment, I'll be right back. John Marriott, rising through the company, but never really the executive and the man that his father was, in style, in delivery, in relationships with people. J John seemed to be a little tense and, uh, and you know, pulled back and wasn't that sociable. Anyway, um, recently, within the last year or two, well, some years ago, John Marriott learned that his dad decided he would not run the company. He would be the first Marriott not to run the company that was in line to do so. And a non-Marriott was hired by the name of Arnie Sorensen, and he runs Marriott today as CEO. Bill Marriott, the 86-year-old, is still you know, chairman emeritus, and, um, and uh, Arnie Sorensen is the son of a Lutheran minister from Minnesota, and an absolutely great guy, and there could have been no one better to run the company than him. And I, I, we were in Africa on a trip uh, since we retired, and we, in Africa, in South Africa, and we ran into some people at a hotel, and they said, oh, do you know Arnie Sorensen? We were just at a conference. So for a non-married, he is very well loved. But John Marriott, the son that lost out uh, a, a year or so ago, we learned that John um, is divorcing his wife, Angie, which is kind of unheard of in a family like the Marriott. And he was going to marry um, a lingerie model uh, from Paris that he met while in France. So, I mean, I, I don't know enough about that, but you can, you can, you know, it just doesn't seem to fit with John and Angie married in the family, uh, uh, plus the divorce. Anyway, uh, uh, Bill Marriott is so shocked and put off by this uh, that he pulls uh, the inheritance money from John. Uh, John still has some money and he was running, John was running, when he, John had left the company once he was no longer in line to run it, and he was running the Marriott Family Foundation, um, you know, with some funds that they would, you know, as you can imagine how much money that family has, uh, that he would do goodwill with, and he also would buy some properties and make other investments for the Family Foundation. And um, once Bill Marriott decided to do this, and, and, and John Marriott would not get his inheritance money, John Marriott, to Greg's point, uh, decided to sue his dad and did so uh, within the last six months. And he also decided to sue his father's brother, Richard Marriott, because Richard, you know, has uh, a little bit more money than Bill. Uh, believe it or not, they both have uh, a big family money from their success. And um, Washingtonian Magazine, which uh, John and Juanita and maybe others will know well, um, decided to do an article about this and found me in Chautauqua. They, they found me on my Chautauqua home phone and I've been retired for years and, and up, living up here in the winter when, when we're not out of town and um, called me and said, you were like uh, the PR guy for Marriott for 30 some years. Would you talk to me? Well, I shouldn't have talked to the magazine, Susie said, and I probably shouldn't have. I should know better. I wasn't following my PR lessons that I tell others. But there was a quote in the article uh, by me uh, that said uh, uh, something like, John Marriott did everything he needed to do to rise up in the company, but he was never quite comfortable, you know, in, his, uh, in social settings, in media interviews, and, you know, he just didn't have those kind of skills, uh, i.e., like his father. 
And uh, so that quote is in the Washingtonian article that came out in the January issue this year. And uh, I crawled back into print uh, 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 after I'd been out of it for years. Um, anyway, uh, that uh, is uh, some things she didn't include in the article that I wish she had, and then why I did agree to go on the record, as they say, and be quite, is that it's a shame. It's, 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 it, it saddens me. It's a shame. They are um, a great family in Washington, D.C., you know, funding everything that they, almost that they can help with, from Heart Association uh, to Red Cross to, to Kennedy Center to others. Uh, when I was at Marriott, I had the pleasure of meeting Juanita Jackson. Uh, she called me and we were able to help out a little bit, not like the Marriott Family Foundation normally does, with the choir. What, it, what was the formal name of the choir, Juanita? Well, <laughs> <laughs> they decided I can't remember. Oh, my goodness. Well, when The Washington Choir. Yes, the, wa the Washington Choir. Yeah the, yeah, the Washington Performing Arts Choir, uh, a choir that Juanita was instrumental in, in either starting or certainly performing in and managing. And we were able to uh, help uh, give a little bit to that. And I was able to meet Juanita before I met her in Chautauqua. But uh, anyway, it's very sad that that is happening with the Marriott family. Uh, I don't know how uh, that will work out. Uh, all the, the, the brothers and sisters, David, the youngest brother, Debbie, uh, John's older sister, they're all saying, um, you know, we, 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 we just want John to be okay. You know, we, we don't understand this. We, we love John. We want him to be okay. That's their kind of comment. Uh, obviously, it's a legal matter, and um, I, uh, I don't know what the final upshot of that would be, will be. Two points about the family before I move on. Debbie Marriott, who sh is the sharpest of the children, finally did come into the company, and she should have been groomed, I think, long ago to run it. Just never was. But she is senior vice president of government relations, and she handles all the sensitive stuff that you can imagine Marriott needs to deal with as one of the top 10 largest employers. Would you ever think of that? Marriott's one of the top 10 largest employers in the US. Uh, so there's a lot of issues uh, on Capitol Hill with employment uh, and with other government regulation, with taxation, with anything you can think of for a company the size of Merit that she uh, handles uh, and lobbies uh, Capitol Hill. And David Marriott, the youngest son who's 40-something now, is doing well. The Pex bad boy as he was growing up is the best uh, son of all. He has his father's personality, disposition, very friendly, very likable, great wife. And hopefully uh, when Arnie Sorensen, who has come in to run the company as the first time married, when he's done and ready to retire, he's around 55, I think, or maybe a little older now, David Marriott will be ready to run the company as a Marriott. You know, one of the nice things about Roger, when you're listening, and you would not have picked this up, but you kept referring to we this, we that, <laughs> and that is a true blue Marriott yeah. public relations guy then and now. Yeah. And the fact that you were able to save yourself in front of all the females that are in the audience here <laughs> is, a, is the ultimate uh, uh, well, kudos to that. Well, it is. It's my, I mean, you do, we do say we forever when you're married. And it's that kind of company. I mean, their motto, just to, to uh, make this uh, final note, their motto, uh, and, and Jay Willard Marriott's motto was, if you take good care of your people, they will take good care of the customer and the business will take care of itself. It's an interesting, not only an interesting comment, but it's an interesting sequence for businesses. Because before he thinks about the profit and the business, that's what he means, he talks about taking care of his people, taking care of the and then you make the money. Also, one thing I, I promised myself I would do, uh, since I did uh, probably 250 grand openings over the years with Bill Marriott. I mean, that, that was in my camp. Uh, what I had to listen to at those 250 grand openings, every one of them, was the following. Because Bill Marriott would come, he would be a guest speaker, and when Bill Marriott would go to the microphone, he liked to open up with a little story. And you can't imagine how many times I heard this story. <laughs> Bill Marriott's at the microphone, had a grand opening. Good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. He said, uh, I thought you might be interested in about the traveling salesman 
that uh, came in, you know, to a um, hot shop, one, one of our hot shops, one day, and came in, traveling some, came in the hot shop, sits right down in the booth, and uh, very shortly, a, a waitress walks up and says, uh, may I help you? And he said, uh, yes, she said, I'll have uh, two eggs over easy and a few kind words. Waitress turns on her heel, walks away. Guy's sitting there. Very shortly, waitress comes back, puts the eggs down on the table with the toast, starts to walk away. And salesman says, what about those kind words? She says, don't eat them eggs. <laughs> It worked for 34 years for Bill Merritt. I imagine, uh, can you imagine uh, Bill Merritt now that they bought Starwood being at a W Hotel, which is the hot, hip, cool hotel of all time, not like Merritt, and Bill Merritt doing a grand opening and telling that story at a W Hotel. That would be interesting. Anyway, um, one last thought, uh, oh no, one last mention. When I was talking about Susie and um, ice skating, I forgot that also here tonight is Cole Stern who skated at the very same time as Susie, and they knew each other when they were ice dancers together in figure skating, and we re reconnected maybe uh, 10 or more years ago, in uh, 10 to 15 years ago in, in Erie at a wedding. So it's good to have you here, Cole and Kathy. Thank you for coming. And Greg, thank you so much. With all that, that was kind of